Great. Welcome, yeah. Jan Flaska. Yeah. Thanks. So I'll, I'll just, to begin, I'll just say that I'm really glad to be back. This, this school, this campus, the people here were very good to me in my short time here. And actually, I have a number of memories from that year, but one of them, and I remember it very well, is April 1st of 1997, there was a massive snowstorm. And I, I was shocked that it was happening uh, on my visit again. So, um, so in any case, thanks very much for um, hosting me. I, I did uh, teach physics for a little while uh, after I left here. And you'll see kind of hints of this uh, interest in science as we get talking a little bit. So in any case, so thank you. So I've titled my talk, When God Says April Fools. Um, I chose it obviously because of the date, and uh, in the end I, uh, I hope to have a little bit of discussion about some of the things I've shared with you, uh, but I'll just begin with some prepared remarks. Conspiracy is not a term one would likely associate with God's pedagogical methods, but a cursory contextual reading of many religious scriptures clearly reveals that God, with all due respect, is a prankster. The last time I heard that phrase, with all due respect, the boys on my corridor at Deerfield Academy invited me for a viewing of Talladega Nights, The Legend of Ricky Bobby. In that movie, in addition to the many comical calls for the intervention of baby Jesus, there are these strong evangelical references to the notion that God instructs Ricky through his personal failures and successes. Ricky, as we learn, is a NASCAR pariah turned messiah. In other words, in order to teach Ricky a lesson, God allows Ricky to lose races, lose confidence, lose his wife, and in a memorable scene, to lose his pants. That was a funny scene. Similarly, in moments of renewed faith, Ricky connects with success, finding it often when he least expects it. Though the parallel is there with the movie, and I know it is a stretch, scripturally based tomfoolery can only lead to one conclusion. God is a master of divine shock therapy. In divine shock therapy theology, it is observed that God often employs a punchline, a nudge nudge, wink wink, a just kidding in developing properly prepared disciples, reminding us that for every, if you're not first, you're last. There is the comparably strong and vastly more powerful sentiment, the last shall be first. Our quick dip into four faith traditions will call out God the jokesmith. By the way, it is not lost in me that, on me that in this lesson, phrases like conspirator, conspirator and prankster are being used uh, and associated with God. Because Father Sebastian's here, I'll set up confession when we finish. God's fun and games began with Arjuna, a, a perceptive prince in the eyes of the Hindu tradition. It is no mystery that his story, above all others, has become fully synonymous with that internal, personal uncertainty we often feel encroaching in our lives when struggling with the question of the right thing to do. Facing an army of enemies, and as the skilled archer drawing his bow back to start the battle, Arjuna looks across and is shocked to see that God has brought him to a place where opposite him stand many family members that he knows and loves. His bow and brow drop. How can he, even as a great warrior, demand the same blood that flows in him? The greatest dilemma one might ever face is thrust at him. Due diligence to God or loyalty to his family. Well, Arjuna, surprise. God's candid response is shocking. Drop the guilt of familial loyalty. Raise the bow against your brother. Embrace the duty you carry in your role as warrior. Even though your heart tugs at you to submit to your human emotions, rise above it and commit the act of which there may be no compare. Kill your family and demonstrate yourself to be a worthy disciple of God. To be clear, Arjuna, in this case, their lives should be of no consequence to you. Though the flesh will die, their spark, their moment of existence will yet be among us again. This is shock therapy indeed. In the case of the Buddhist tradition, and in the story of a man named Siddhartha, it is worth adjusting our definition of God, bringing it in line more fully with the notion of God, if it is to be called as such, can be everything and everyone, nothing and no one, all at once. The Buddhist God, which is mostly expressed as a reverence for the actions of Siddhartha, 
is in a sense positioned contrarily to all those things that make us human. Among them, personal satisfaction. The thought that my interests usurp yours. For this reason, if there is such a thing as the God of Buddhism, that God is anthropopic or anti-human to the extreme. So now, Siddhartha, living as a prince and forbidden from ever leaving his palace, is the next prophetic figure to be shocked into discipleship. In his twenties, a small urge develops in his belly. Here is a royal man of prestige and power, living a life of lavish luxury, answering to no one other than the instincts and needs all humans have, yet few are able to realize. In recurrent disillusionment with this state, he begs a friend to help him see if there is a greater truth than the one he knows. Finally escaping from his royal reality, he climbs the barrier out of his palace into the mystery that awaits him out there where once in his estate he only saw the rewards of life, happiness, abundance of food, the best of all things, he now walks the streets finding filth, hunger, beggars, death, the truths of existence, the truths of the reality outside of the, the palace. These cause him to reevaluate the notion of what, it is that, of what it is that is of value to human existence. From that moment, we fast forward many years, and at the conclusion of this nearly decade-long search for truth, he enters into a state of consciousness which tells him that all things of value are to be found internally and in community with others rather than externally and living apart from others. Those that had become his disciples began to raise up Siddhartha not as a god, but as an expression of lived truth that was found through a demanding and lived search. He is now the man known as the Buddha. So, expectedly awakened to this true reality, this pseudo-god, the Buddha, advances the follies of divine shock therapy on his own. There is the famous story of the Buddha being called to intervene in the plight of a young mother who carries her recently deceased infant in her arms. She walks from house to house seeking some ancient remedy to cure her dead son of the, of the death that came to him early in his life. Unwilling to accept his death, she hears that the Buddha can help her solve her son's death. When she arrives at his doorway, the Buddha gladly welcomes the mother and says that he in fact does have the cure for death. He instructs the young mother that in order to be cured of death, she must first go and get a common mustard seed from any home where death has not come. She eagerly leaves the, the scene and goes from house to house, asking the question, has death been here, has death been here, only to discover that it has in every home. At the end of the day, in her forlorn state, the young mother comes to the realization that she is not alone in the death and the grief that she has experienced, and that death, death comes to all living beings. Immediately, she understands the cure for which she was seeking. She instantly hands her son to her family to be cremated on the funeral pyre. So like time travelers sampling the best of history, we can spring now to a time with a very different God. A God up there, at a distance, and completely in control of all things. This God, perhaps known as Marduk to the Babylonians, or Yahweh to the Hebrews, played perhaps the greatest of all pranks on his most devoted of disciples. In both of these cultural traditions, there is a famous and parallel story of, a God, of God playing a nearly lifelong April Fool's prank on a devout and pious disciple. In the Hebrew tradition, he was known as Job. In spite of Job's complete dedication to God, God somehow succumbs to this small urge, this devilish whisper, to question Job's faith. As a younger man with family stability, land to call his own, predictable source of food, and strong health, Job is shocked, divinely that is, to discover that he is slowly losing all those things of comfort that he has come to know in his life. He loses his family, his livestock, his fields become barren and bitter. He becomes unremittingly ill. His life is overturned, flipped on its head at the whim of a God who is curious just to see how far this prank can go. 
This April Fool's Day joke must have seemed like an eternity to Job, and yet, as the ever-faithful ever servant, it is only for the briefest of moments when his life seemed unendurable, when his pain seemed un unbearable, and was, when his God seemed unknowable, that Job spoke out and said, Why God? Why me? Perhaps as surprising as, as it is to Job, as it continues to be the, to those that hear this story, God's first response is, Who are you, Job, to question me? Where were you when I expressed my majesty in the creation around you? With deep humility and regret, and divinely shocked to the core, Job recedes from the scene while God further clarifies God's stance in this situation. Who are you, Job, to question me? Succumbing to this prank and test of faith, Job now cowers before God. Then, in an instant, an unexpected twist, God changes course, bringing an end to the torment. All things are restored to Job fully. Yet, are all things righted? Many, and I would exclude Job, would name God's divine injustice in this situation, saying that this prank had gone too far. Even to this day, the, the most devout adherent must struggle with this episode of fate. And folly? Move forward into the common era, and examining the Christian tradition, one can see that the idea of a suffering servant at the hands of God took hold to the nth degree. In the years preceding, I'm sorry, are there any tissues here? <laughs> if not, it's not a problem. I'll just sniffle away. In the years preceding the life of Jesus of Nazareth, and in response to repeated persecution, some of the later biblical Jewish communities began to imagine and to pray for the ultimate April Fool's prank to be played on their aggressors. The possibility that God would resurrect deceased Jewish soldiers that were lost in righteous battle. This desire of resurrecting life that was wrongly taken grew fervently, taking hold in such a way that the notion of a God-appointed Messiah coming to intervene in history and on behalf of the oppressed prominently emerged. It is no surprise then that a small community of broken Jewish citizens began to mar marvel at the words and works of Jesus of Nazareth and that their uncertain murmurings became more pronounced. Is he the one to intervene, to bring God's will to all people, to bring life from death? Hope in this possibility grew palpable, but a tremendous divinely, appro divinely approved event astonished them and for a moment extinguished their spirit that held this hope. In one of the great historical religious paradoxes, the enemy brutally killed the savior of a people. All was lost in the scene of a bloody public crucifixion. The followers of Jesus receded, not knowing, not knowing what to do given what they saw. In those few days and weeks that followed, they had no idea of the shock that awaited them, of God's hidden message and the surprise to come. Not only would God end this seismic prank by bringing this charismatic son of God and healing prophetic, thank you, Rebbe back to life, but it would be concluded in the most curious of ways, a bodily resurrection presented to two mourning women. In that time, to be certain, there were few less authoritative witnesses. Perhaps this kind of scandalous closure to such an already unexpected development unequivocally, unequivocally proves God to be the uber prankster. Well then, if one is a believer, and if one believes that there is some kind of external order to existence, one message to be taken from this group of scripturally based examples of God's pedantic humor can be this fact. For those that were and are the target of these pranks, hope is a paramount, yet sometimes elusive, commodity to the uncertainty that is the will of God. To call it as it is, any person of faith in a situation any person of faith in any situation, whether benign or busy, temperate or tempestuous, can but only ultimately trust in the intentions of God and that those intentions are directed to our benefit and not our demise. It is a hard reality for sure, and one only needs to stand in solidarity with Arjuna, or the mother that sought Siddhartha, or Job, or those that saw their hero on the cross, or even when in our own life-changing events, to, to appreciate that trying, futile and desperate moments might one day lead to new hope, new life, and renewed faith. I'm not kidding. So, thank you. 
Uh, so I, um, I have a little bit of a lesson, or a, I guess, yeah, a lesson prepared for us. It's taken from a class that I taught last spring as an elective to seniors called The Search for Meaning. Uh, and I thought, given the scenarios I've just presented you, we could talk for a moment about ways in which those kinds of moments might come to be in our own lives. Um, before I begin, is there anything I could clarify for you uh, about what I've said? Okay. So, it's no problem. It's, silence is good, uh, if you don't mind me speaking. Uh, so, as part of the course that I taught, and I think uh, uh, cleanly connected both to the book of Job and connected to uh, the talk that I just gave, I've, uh, I've come up with this uh, term, if I can call them that, uh, schismic moments. And when you speak about one's life, uh, I'll step on this side now, when you speak about one's life, um, you have these moments that begin to, um, to provide a little bit of insight into uh, what really matters to you, what really matters to us. Uh, schismic moments are these shocking, uh, life-altering uh, or perspective-altering moments Sorry, that, uh, that can help one understand better uh, the, the notion of meaning, right? Or the notion of why one exists and does what he or she does. Um, so you can think about this in terms of, if we speak about Job specifically, uh, whether it be fate, if you remove God out of that situation, bad luck with ill health and all that, or when you have this theistic perspective and the subplot of God's conversation with Satan, with this adversary, that maybe there's some theistic or some, some God-directed uh, 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 intentions happening in order for Job to go through this suffering. So I wondered if I could get four or five quick uh, responses or brief responses on what kind of moments in our own lives would you classify as schismic? What are the moments in your life where life is completely changed? And when I say your, I don't mean your own personal experiences. I mean speaking generally about all people, young, adult, uh, in all sorts of different environments. Yes, sir? Birth of a child. Birth of a child. That's a great, great comment. Well, can I, I'll just perhaps add a little commentary if there's ever something that's, uh, that uh, I feel strongly about. I agree very much in the moment you are responsible for a life that's not your own, it's, uh, it's a schismic moment, right? I would agree with that. Yes, sir? Rejected from your top college. Rejected from your top college. The timing on that comment is really interesting. Very true, right? I, I think uh, the, the perspective on the front end of that versus the back end is, is, uh, is worth commenting on as well, right? As you grow, I think about my own college experiences, and I went to a school I didn't know at all, and it was the right school for me, right? When I was there in your spot, I probably felt uh, like it was a rough day also. Losing a loved one. Losing a loved one. So uh, for me, if, um, if I was to talk about uh, the relevance of religions in the world, I think you can always come to the question of death, the uncertainty of death. And I think if there's a use, and I would say there's many, but if there's a use for religions, I think answering the question of death is a great example. Maybe one more, is there anything else you can think of? Gold star, that guy, gold star. Uh, that's very true, a near-death experience. Um, so, so let me just move us forward here a little bit. And uh, we wanted to end, can you help me out here? We're good, okay. Uh, okay, so with these events in one's life, Perhaps you begin to ask questions about meaning, about uh, how, you, you, uh, how you interpret those kinds of events in terms of your worldview, let's say. And uh, in a successive slide, I'll just uh, begin to whittle away at that a little bit more. But for a moment, um, maybe if we step away from the serious schismic uh, events, let's just uh, maybe let's get uh, you know, four other people that haven't spoken. Now it's, the question's a little bit easier, perhaps. Um, 
what are some questions? If you wanted to explore uh, life's meaning with a friend, what, what are some questions you could ask each other? What are the meaningful questions to ask that, that cause one to look internally, to cause one to ask about purpose? Yeah. What drives you? What drives you? Great. Yeah. You can just throw them out too. I think this, these are, there's a lot there. Sir? Why are we here? Why are we here? Talk about emotions, maybe. How about that? Give me some questions with emotions in them. Why does one smile? What makes you happy, right? Why does one frown? Right? What makes you sad, right? What things bring you joy? What things bring you pain? Right? Is meaning, is it a meaningful life? Can a meaningful life be lived through pain? Does a meaningful life need to be happy? Right? Did you have something to add? I'm sorry. To yeah. So, so all those questions can lead you toward that, uh, toward that conversation. I, I've put. Um, you, there must be some students here that could translate that. Yes. I think. Yeah. Therefore, the, I think. Therefore, I am. Right. And so, I guess that uh, the fact that we can self-reflect on our own meaning, at least for one philosopher that may be well known. Uh, it's obvious then that we can ask questions of, of meaning, right? Perhaps something that the animal world uh, can't do, perhaps, right? We're not exactly sure. Um, the one question that uh, I, I, I would say is, is pivotal, pivotal as perhaps the ultimate question. Uh, in the context of life's meaning, it begins with the question of whether or not some external uh, force, power, uh, some God exists. I think that uh, if we are here, let me talk about it uh, sort of from a secular perspective, if we are here through the uh, accidents or predictable patterns or possible patterns of an evolutionary biology, that's one way to understand what our purpose is, right? And I think you would have very different kinds of phrases for what it means to have a successful, happy, meaningful life. You take the other side, which includes this idea of a God, some greater power, some greater force, and that perhaps life is a gift, life is a plan. Then you begin to understand your life in the context of that plan. So. I would actually, if anybody, this is one place to challenge me, and I got it a lot last spring, I would cleanly split the discussion into these two sections. I think you have to take, uh, in, not you have to take that stand, but in the terms of this conversation, I think you can't answer it on a middle ground here. Life has a very different meaning if there's a God versus if there isn't a God. I've uh, shared a couple of very general sentiments about the scientific secular perspective on that. Uh, the search for meaning, control and transparency, understanding, being able to replicate, um, uh, being able to replicate experimental data, being able to understand life through patterns that we see in other places. In the context of religion, uh, I would say a faith-based understanding of the world instantly assumes meaningful existence. If we were uh, offered the gift to be alive, there must be a reason for us to be alive. Uh, so th three additional questions and uh, the, the commentary about death was right on because I would say that um, understanding death from those two perspectives can, can uh, provide us the ability to kind of look beyond the lived life and to ask the question of what happens next. Even if there isn't a God, even if there isn't a theistic understanding of our existence, can somebody talk about the ways in which life may be immortal? Pull God out of it and can somebody talk about the way in which life might be immortal? Sir? Like when you die, your memories are lived on by those who are still alive? Perfect. So you, you exist in the memories, thoughts of others, right? Uh, can somebody take kind of a uh, uh, 
a biological um, step to answer that question. Pardon me? Your children. So your children continue to exist. Yeah? And I'm going to just uh, keep pushing you a little bit. The dead body that you put in the ground. How can that be immortal? It'll be there forever. It'll be there forever. What are we made of? Bones, tissue, right? We're, we're basically based, uh, we're basically built of the things that give life to other organisms in a sense, right? We're no different than generations before and our death and passing in some way gets built back into this earth beneath us to then recreate life. Memories, children, and then just the fact of our, uh, of our uh, nature, what we're made of, presents the opportunity for the next series of lives. Um, name uh, three traditions uh, description of immortality, of where or how it happens. Incarnation. Incarnation. There's a great one. A cyclical existence, right? Name another. The afterlife. The afterlife. That's two. Pardon me? We all want to get to heaven. heaven, right? So there's lots of different ways to talk about it, okay? Uh, but there is, in, in many religious traditions, the question of the afterlife is answered through, perhaps through doctrine, right? Would anybody truly know, be able to report back on what happens when you die? I would say probably not. Faith provides an answer, right? Okay, so I, I shared the question of whether we, the question of life's meaning, whether we see it from a secular scientific view or whether we see it from a religious view. I think that answering the question of life's meaning has to take a stand to one side or the other, that it's tricky and not clean to answer it standing with a foot in both uh, realms. So, again, this is my proposal of what it means to be human, what it means to have a meaningful life in the context of um, science outside of the realm of a uh, world that's presided over by some other uh, being, by some other force. And as I read it down, species sustenance, uh, there's this idea that procreation is a meaningful existence or the ability to, the success of uh, procreating your species. The second is um, evolving the species in a productive way. And um, just as an example, I heard your comment, um, Samanya, about cell phones. You know, you're in a good place at Deerfield. We totally ban them uh, around. So um, it's, uh, we get a lot of grief in the dean's office about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, have we evolved? Have we evolved in terms of our ability, to, as a species, in terms of our ability to communicate and in what way? Let me ask the second row on the left here, one of the eight of you. Have we evolved in our ability to communicate? Yeah. And how so? Perfect. Yeah, so advances in technology have made us, as a species, more capable of communicating over great distances with different people, right? So are we, you can ask the question, are we becoming a more meaningful species because, as an example, we can communicate better? Uh, and lastly, uh, perhaps like any, if you have pets, um, if you have, uh, I guess if you've you know, uh, seen any of the, the movies uh, that take you through the, the wilds of Africa, the idea of survival, of limiting the amount of pain you incur is a very natural feeling. You want to be happy, right? So a meaningful life in this case, I would say, um, in a sense requires you to have more happiness than pain. You want to be in a place where there's limited pain. And pain, it, you know, it's, it's not pain. It's, it's pain. It's a, it's a holistic kind of pain. It can be painful, right? It can be those things that are injurious. Uh, but, uh, but I'm speaking about it in very general terms. You move towards places where there's less pain. In fact, there's a, uh, an anthropologist that says the greatest distinction between humans and the, the species of animals uh, from which they've emerged is that those animals go to places where it's more comfortable. Humans make places that are more comfortable. 
So the AC or heater that's running r right now is, in, is demonstrating that we're human. Animals would generally move south, right? I don't know if that's probably putting hot air in or maybe it's just circulating air, so. Okay. All right, so the second perspective, I've got two more slides here, I'm doing great. Uh, the second perspective is the theistic perspective, the religious perspective, and I would offer that uh, questions of meaning can be evaluated, or, or, or the idea of meaning can be evaluated through these three, these three different realms. One is um, honoring the sacred. How well, how properly, how frequently do you revere that which gave you life, he who gave you life? Right? So you honor those things that are sacred. And for some indigenous, perhaps Native American traditions, it was Mother Earth, right? Uh, the, the, the sun god is a very prominent god in Egyptian, Central and South American indigenous communities. And, and uh, so how, how properly do you, do you revere, do you honor the sacred? Uh, the second idea is uh, properly tolerating the human condition. And this contrasts with that pain proposal. Um, many traditions talk about uh, in a sense, our bodily existence holding us back a bit, uh, restricting us in some way, that there's something inside of us that is uh, superior uh, to that which is on the outside, right? Many, not all. Uh, so given that we have this condition that surrounds the true self that we are, the Atman, the soul, how do we handle that fact? Uh, there's this uh, idea of original sin. Uh, there's different ways in which we understand the fact that the human condition is a, is a tough, demanding condition that requires these rituals to overcome or to mediate it. And then uh, finally we talked about uh, heaven, uh, moksha, the release. You have nirvana, the afterlife. Um, I've already forgotten the first one that you offered. Incarnation, right? Reincarnation. Uh, so there's all these ideas. You work towards achieving some kind of a realization, some kind of a full consciousness, and uh, that is a uh, common idea in many religious traditions. I want to get to heaven. I don't want to go to H-E, to heck, right? Or hell, whatever you call it. So those might be the goals in our, uh, in our own lives. Okay? All right. And... Um, at the end of the class that I taught in the spring, uh, the goal of the class was not to come up with an answer, it was to come up with a question. Uh, because in a sense, all, all meaning is relative, or our meaning is relative. So when I put out the syllabus, I said, uh, we're not learning what to know, we're learning how to ask the right question. And at the end, with you know, a lot of conversations, uh, we came up with this question as the best possible question if I wanted to ask uh, someone about what their life means or how, how they see their pur purpose or nature. Uh, this was the question to ask. And this obviously this question can, can be thrown into the realm of, of a no God life or a, a God filled life, right? Um, and so this is how we ended it. Is anybody willing to answer that question? It's, it's a hard question. It's, you don't have to answer it. Um, so in any case, so that's, that's what we came up with. Um, any comments, commentary about things I've said? Because uh, those are all the PowerPoints. Now I'd just be ad-libbing. <laughs> What's your answer to that question? My answer? Well, I, so what I invited the students to do is to actually prioritize them. So I think the first question, if, if, if it's difficult to answer, I, I'm, I'm sorry, let me say it differently. Uh, if the answer to your first question is, is no, uh, it, it, um, it means that your life has been less meaningful than others, right? So. Do, do I force myself to say yes, or can I say yes? I think I can say yes on the first one. I, I would say this, that you know, the more, maybe the older you get, uh, the more you come to appreciate each year. And uh, I have you know, a son, now I just want to live long enough to seem to get to kindergarten. You know, now I want to just live long enough to do this, to do this. So, so could we be content at the point you're at right now in your life? 
our legacy, I think, is the hardest question. I have no idea what people would remember about me. So, um, and I know my mother would miss me. That's the one thing I know. I need to outlive my mother. That's, that's the one thing I need to do is outlive my mother. So, uh, so that's all I have for you then. I'll go ahead and just end it, so, yeah. So I guess I just invite any questions or comments I've been asking for, but is there anything that's worth mentioning here? It's good to take risks, especially when you have a guest speaker. I've been in Miss Omania's uh, shoes very often. I bring speakers to campus, so here's just a little plug. Uh, do we have time for this or no? Oh yeah, okay, okay, okay. So can I hold you for five or ten more minutes if there's anything to share? Um, does anybody want to challenge that notion, the religious? and the secular world that you have to be in one place or another to talk about? Like, can you be in a place of uncertainty and, and uh, understand life's meaning? That was probably the biggest conversation starter that we had in, in the last uh, you know, week, two weeks of class. Okay, so you have to be put in a difficult position. You have to have a schismic moment. Um, yeah. I, I, think, I think those moments, obviously, those are the moments that allow a chance to self-reflect, right? Uh, I would say your graduation in two months, I, I would say that's a very, very important moment. You know, we're planning our prom, and I remember my high school prom really well. Is that a schismic moment? You know, uh, I remember it well, so. <laughs> Sir. Uh, is, uh, is it okay to be in the middle between schismic moments? I think you're right. Schismic moments give you clarity and you can say for sure I'm here or here. But I think if you're in between those moments that come so far, I guess I find myself in between those two worlds. Yeah, yeah. So I, it takes one of those moments to be clear. It took yeah. me a long time for me to get there and be okay with that. Yeah. I, I think the, the near-death experience example is, is really the best. And in some respects, that's kind of what I wanted to share with you in the first four examples, right? Arjuna is, if he doesn't fight, he will be killed, right? And in a sense, he doesn't mind for the beginning to be killed by his family because what's, what's the option to be the killer, right? So I think, I think that... Uh, Th those moments, near-death experience or whatever it is, are the ones that actually invite you to self-reflect. Um, and when you're not in those, I would say, you know, be happy, because uh, uh, the ones that really are life-changing, um, you know, often can be difficult. And a difficult happy, right, or a difficult sad, but just difficult, demanding of you. Um, so I, I think, it's, I think it's, it's often that we're between those moments and, um, you know, looking back on them or looking towards those experiences with other people. And in the end, I think scriptures, um, can, can I just ask, how, how many, have, has anybody, would you just raise your hand if you've read the Bhagavad Gita or part of it? Okay, it's a Hindu scripture, right? Yeah, it's great. You're, you're in the minority, in the global minority, I got to tell you, right? Which is perfectly fine. I was about eight years ago. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. I usually teach it in the spring to seniors. Yeah. Capstone has replaced it this year. Okay. These guys didn't, yeah. they were not able to opt yeah. for yeah. Yeah. And I, I just mean to say we're we're victims of our own environment, right? If you're in another part of the world, you know much less about the Bible, perhaps, and much more about a scripture like the Bhagavad Gita. And I just mean to say that 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 whole setting there is a schismic moment that we read about that we don't have to experience. You know, you'd much rather learn from somebody's experiences than go through them. In near death experience, you'd rather learn from a drunk driving accident than be in it, right? And so in a sense, scriptures provide us that, and uh, the Bhagavad Gita, as Job and all these other, are opportunities for that, so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.